a broad spectrum professional people from the field of our sciences so i hope they will be certainly benefited from that uh before uh, as uh, i'll although dr tiwari was just talking to our uh, speaker uh, but i'll request uh, tiwari ji to formally welcome and uh, our speaker and uh, after that i'll introduce to the audience also although he is very well known but as formal introduction so tiwari ji please namaskar and um, very good morning uh, to today's uh, speaker uh, dr ranjit rat a very distinguished uh, geoscientist and uh, administrator explorationist my dear colleagues from uh, aeg office bearers and members of the association of exploration geophysicist and several of the uh, students and colleagues joined through the online media today we are uh, very happy and uh, pleased in this grateful uh, morning having uh, dr rat with us uh, who is uh, very well known for his work and uh, he is uh, even in uh, recent time more known of uh, bringing his organization in forefront of the exploration of natural resources particularly the mineral resources and uh, also involved in several of the policy making at the national level he held uh, the position for some time as an additional charge of the director general of geological survey of india that is the uh, biggest geoscience organization in the country and probably uh, one among the largest geoscientist pool uh, in the world with his experience uh, we look forward for listening about what is uh, expected from you scientists in coming decade the topic is uh, so appropriate that it does not uh, only uh, require uh, the attention of uh, the mature geo scientists and professionals but also exciting about um, about this work and topic by the students you are also aware that the association of exploration geophysicists over the decade have been trying to bring the knowledge and also reaching to the uh, industry connect between uh, um, connecting in academic to the industry through the association ag particularly in the exploration geophysics uh, uh areas been trying to bring the uh, good number of uh, the reputed and known uh, explorationist uh, for its uh, event whether it is the annual uh, event or or any specific lecture and for today aid is showed uh, and invited invited professor uh, dr uh, ranjit rat for a uh, talk on a very uh, important topic what is being particularly we will be doing in the coming decade how will it be important for uh, science economy and the society so with this uh, i request the secretary ag to formally uh, introduce today the speaker of uh, ag to the audience dr chaturvedi it's over to you thanks so uh 
Today's uh, guest speaker, Dr. Ranjit Rath, is presently well known in the Earth Science fraternity. A brief biodata, although there is a lot of things to tell about him, but uh, I'll be just telling in brief about his credentials. Uh, Dr. Ranjit Rath is an alumni of IIT Bombay, IIT Kharagpur, IFT Delhi, and also I'm Ahmedabad. He has uh, been a very, very professional uh, and he has contributed a lot in the geoscience application in the projects, project execution, corporate strategy and the business development when he was a part of uh, Engineers India Limited. Every, uh, we all know that he is a National Geoscience Awardee in 2016. And presently, he is the CMD of Mineral Exploration Corporation India Limited. He is having additional charge of the managing director of uh, Bharat Gold Mines. And he is CEO of newly formed company, the very, very important company, uh, very strategic, Kabil, uh, where we are looking for the uh, uh, stakes in some of the foreign deposits, particularly for the strategic minerals. So uh, if we see that uh, he's uh, responsible at present for a uh, very, very important uh, things related to the mineral exploration in the country, the policy forming, exploration in the country, exploration outside country, exploration of uh, common minerals, on exploration related to the strategic minerals. So uh, his vision for how it is going to happen and what as a geoscientist we are likely to do in the coming period, what we should do to make that all these ventures successful so that India can contribute much more than what it is contributing right now in its GDP. Apart from this, he has uh, written a lot of uh, books. He has published technical papers. And more than that, he is a avid HR practitioner, which is very, very important uh, because it is the uh, human resources which are going to do the things, things to happen, whatever is being planned by the government. So this is uh, now I hand over to Dr. Ranjit Rath for his lecture. We all are waiting for that. Dr. Ranjit Rath, please. A warm good morning to uh, all of you. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Chaturbedi for giving me this uh, privilege to be part of this August gathering. And uh, I would say that it's not a monologue. Uh, it's a kind of interaction that I would look forward. So uh, Dr. Chaturbedi, thank you very much for that. It is an honor to be part of this August gathering. And I will tell you why. And uh, before I proceed on the talk, uh, a very con good context setting by Dr. Tiwari, who is heading one of the most crucial organization on the research front in the country as far as geoscience is concerned. Uh, it takes immense pride to acknowledge the kind of research which is happening in uh, NGRI under the leadership of Prof. Tiwari. Before we formally take on this subject, I would like to remember all those great geologists geophysicists, geochemists, geoscientists, art scientists, who has shaped the context of geology in this country. And while doing so, we must acknowledge the enormous efforts of our revered organizations like Geological Survey of India, revered organizations like Atomic Minerals Division, revered organizations like Mineral Exploration Corporation, and 
several other public sector undertakings research organizations our iits the best part is everybody is doing their bit but the question is is there an collective attempt probably that is something which we could discuss about it and i would leave some questions for the audiences which is listening or participating today when i thought about the title of it i understand that we would address to seasoned professionals in this particular domain and i would also understand that the reach is wide and vast uh, this is one of the positives of the pandemic that we are actually using the online platform to reach out to a wider audience so that gives us a kind of a opportunity not only to restrict ourselves within geographic boundaries or within organization now we have become transnational intercontinental and i also understand that this platform we would have students young enthusiasts just and international participants also so the context of what is that the geoscience would look in next 10 years and how as individual geoscientists we must react or respond or probably prepare ourselves for the future to come while we look at the future part of it it is always better to be reminiscent about what all we have done and if i can recall we have done immensely well immensely well in terms of active research applications of geosciences in varieties of fields as history would look at uh, as geological survey of india the mother organization of geology in this country it was actually institutionalized to look at coal which is the primary energy source then and it continues to be the primary energy source today and even if there is a talk that the primary energy source will have a dent because of the renewables coming into the spree but coal is going to stay here and this is where we all started and we all started means the geoscience for the country started and then something happened very interestingly we had ongc carved out and by then oil india was already in place now having said ongc and oil india in place we have actually discovered hydrocarbon the black oil which is actually the inevitable thing in our economy today whether it is into petrochemicals or it is into mobility or it is into anything and everything that we use in our life having done the oil part and in the coal part we were actually looking at the nuclear energy part so while amd then was born and when amd was born we started looking at uranium thorium and all those series of minerals and then we bought technologies to harvest those mineral resources into energy similarly we also started looking at our bulk minerals as part of the discovery process of geoscientific pursuits so while doing so we did one simple thing we created organizations that is contributing immensely to this country's economy by virtue of bauxite we created nalco by virtue of copper we created hindustan copper limited by virtue of zinc we created hindustan zinc limited we have nmdc per se to handle the iron ore resources we have steel authority of india limited to handle the iron ore resources and several of them then one interesting thing happened 1972 MECL was carved out of GSI and why i am narrating this a brief history is just as a context setting 
that how I, a geologist or I would actually use the term geoscientist because today it is not geophysics per se. It is not physics per se. It is not chemistry per se. It is not geology per se. It is actually together. It is a subject of geoscience which is delivering. And we are not doing it alone. We are doing it together, but there is a need to enhance our collaboration, not only within the subjects or domain experts, but also within the organizations. So having had MECL and then under the umbrella of Coal India, we had CMPDIL. So these two organizations started looking at detailed exploration of mineral resources. While doing detailed exploration, several CSR labs were created to pursue active and fundamental research. And one of them, which was doing and also doing today, is NGRI. <clears throat> now, since I'm talking to AEG, I need not and all the participants would know fairly well the interdisciplinary nature of this subject and the application of geophysics that comes as a non-inversive method to capture the data or to create signatures not only of the earth but also of the ocean and in the ocean bottom and the airborne geophysics part. Now while all this was happening we also had ISRO and Space Application Center and Indian Institute of Remote Sensing and National Remote Sensing Agency, NRSA per se, start looking at the application of remote sensing, not only for various other facets of infrastructure or societal purpose, but also for geology. Now, let's go back to a bit, having created a construct we define the geological milieu of the country by the activities of these organizations per se. And the mother of all organizations, as I have said, is Geological Survey of India. As per Geological Survey of India assessment, from the geology can be distinctly divided into two parts. One is natural resources, so the factor or the subject that deals with natural resource part, which has got tremendous contribution to the economy of the country. The other part is natural hazards, which has been in recent times, been very, very repetitive, scary, horrible, and terrible experiences. Experiences which no one would have thought of. Having kind of a kind of barrier lays two categories of natural hazards and natural resources. The rest all are actually the bigger set of pursuing fundamental geoscience. That includes paleontology, that includes geochronology, that includes microbiology. I mean, all these are small, small sets which contributes for this purpose. We have another beautiful organization in the country that is Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Science. They are doing phenomenal amount of work of application of paleontology or paleo sciences, not only for reconstruction of the geological time scale for India or for the entire globe, but also applying them for discovery of hydrocarbon or more specifically for reservoir characterization. Now, why we are talking about this uh, center of excellences? Because these center of excellences are actually the nests which are available to our young geoscientific enthusiasts to pursue because they need a platform. And when they choose, some are, some are very fortunate to choose their playground. I would call these organizations as the playgrounds and the head of the organizations are primarily the leaders who enable or bring out the best in this young enthusiast 
to pursue a research which has to be unparalleled and cutting edge. Just before these discussions, one thing that comes to my mind was number of technical papers that we produce, number of patents that we could produce, number of discourse or case studies that we share. Coming back to the topic of geoscience in the future would actually require a more collaborative approach amongst all these organizations. And this is where the professional societies like Geological Society of India, Association of Exploration Geosciences, and many more, including the 36 IGC and IUGS, a huge role to play. As seasoned professionals, part of these professional societies, actually we are creating a platform of learning and we are actually allowing ourselves to be questioned and creating an enabling mechanism for these youngsters to learn from our experiences. And again, this is where the online mode has come to our rescue. As you all would appreciate, in recent times, the component of training has really multiplied many times. And this is what was needed. While I acknowledge the efforts of Geological Survey of India Training Institute, to impart training to all and everybody, not only from this country, but 72 countries from overseas. It was constrained by the boundaries of the GSITI training module. But now, because of this particular online mode, we are actually doing a yeoman services and the ramifications are huge. With this context, now let's look at, are we talking about lesser possibilities today that we had 10 years ago? Or are we talking about more possibilities 10 years down the line? When we started geosciences, its primary objective was fundamental research and catering to the energy need. The initial days, the energy need were made from coal. So mineral exploration was one of the major thrust of sciences, or for that matter for hydrocarbon. Then we had development of the hydropower projects. The National Hydropower Project and NHPC has got a very good, strong geoscientific community. Now, while pursuing the geoscience, in hydropower projects, we developed the aptitude and the knowledge base of engineering geology. And that is something which is actually catering to the current need of infrastructure projects where geoscience plays an important role. We name the metros, which is being constructed pan India. We look at the railway tunnels crisscrossing the entire country. We look at the various other infrastructure projects where our geologists or specifically the engineering geology domain is engaged. As we look, we are today challenging the most recent and ever active fault zones or the beautiful Himalayan territory through our knowledge and it is where the geologists talk to the civil engineers and geotechnical engineers seamlessly in a single language. So more specific is in the future to come, we are doing well, but in the future to come, while we in enhance our presence through infrastructural development in the Himalayan territory and on the Northeastern area, primarily for railway tunnel and for hydropower projects, our geologists need to communicate in a 
language which the geotechnical engineers understand because as geologists we have an uncanny ability of something i call it as third eye we are taught or we are trained by our teachers by our immediate bosses by the head of the organization by the leaders whom we emulate in our career an interpretative skill because this is something which is not visible so this is where actually a geoscientist is equipped in terms of its academics and this 3d perspective needs to be communicated to the fellow engineers who are actually implementing the projects so it is important that as geologists while we must speak in the same language to avoid any kind of a miscommunication which has got huge impact in the project per se we must also understand that where these findings or our interpretations are finding its use then only we can appreciate each other then only there will be a kind of a reciprocation of respect between the domains so why this is very very crucial to cross the railway tunnels in the north frontier railways or even the higher reaches of himalaya including the jammu srinagar connect it has got serious impact on the defense mechanism of the country we are also aware of the fact of application of geosciences in creating bunkers in creating resting places or strategic places to provide shelter to our defense forces so these interactions of construction or specific interventions in terms of civil and structure with the earth rock or the rock we understand much better than any civil engineer so we must communicate with them we must communicate with them in that same language and we must understand it so when i say we must understand it our colleagues the geophysicist has got a better mathematical bent of mind so what is that we must look at with our young geologists or we need to harness this is bring in a concept of mathematics or engineering application for our geoscientists now let us come to the mining part of it similarly the mineral ecosystem or the mining and mineral ecosystem is hugely dependent on the exploration of minerals now if we discover something which is uneconomical or economically not viable to be exploited it really doesn't make any sense so that doesn't stop us taking pride in discovering something but the more better philosophy is how we struck something which can be economically viable and harnessed out of it in that context as geologists we must understand the mining practices and the problems or the challenges i would call it as challenges rather the problems because problems are difficult challenges are opportunities so as geologists we must understand that what exactly the mining engineers would require or how we can talk to each other in terms of creating a 3d model and to tell you and you all are aware developing a 3d model after having done a detailed exploration is a thought leadership process so as geologists we should have exposure to all the advanced geological softwares i need not name them but we have dedicated softwares for bedded deposits for coal for hydrothermal deposits even for our atomic minerals so that understanding of softwares and developing the models which can seamlessly translate into a mining development model would be of immense help and that is what in some sectors our people are doing while on the mineral exploration stage nmdc is doing fantastically 
in terms of exploration also. So when we all know that there is a concept of risk taking ability because the success ratio of mineral exploration varies from commodity to commodity. And in case of diamond, it could be one is to 500 or one is to 1000. So we need the best of the equipments, the best of the instruments, the best of the investments. That's all happening. What is required, and I would call upon all the professional societies or the senior leadership who are actually involved in the mining sector. And I'm saying this from the perspective of mining sector. We will touch upon the oil and gas sector in a different manner. We must allow our youngsters or ingrain the quality of taking risk. A risk which could be a delta, a 10 percent or a stage wise risk of 10 percent to 20 percent. Only then the youngsters or the field force will think beyond the boundaries and that will lead to discoveries. Otherwise, till now, as I understand, we have about an OGP area, obvious geological potential area of about 8 lakh, 7 lakh and half square kilometer out of 32 lakh square kilometer of the entire country. Now, these enablers of risk taking ability is ingrained over a period of time. And it has to be taught and it has to be given a free hand to experiment. Because normally what happens in such projects, the exploration cost or the exploratory, exploratory investigation cost of any big project, be it infrastructure or be it exploration and mines, is to the tune of 1% or less than 1%. We should not restrict ourselves. I know there is no limit to it, but is there any harm in letting our younger generation to adopt 1.1% or 2.1% and that is our responsibility and it is a collective responsibility. So I'm sure the similar thing is also in exercise for oil and gas, but there is a difference. Oil and gas by virtue of its nature of existence or occurrence or the kind of technology that has evolved over a period of time because of its necessity and because of its impact in our economy, it has migrated way ahead. And when I say way ahead, that means it is well structured. A single borehole or an exploratory well is drilled after thorough investigation and a layers of decision making process. But then that layers of decision making process actually creates an ecosystem for taking that risk. So all our future people, future geoscientists or geologists must take that delta risk. Now coming to the other part, where all geoscientific research can target. Now there is a fantastic presentation by IUGS, International Geological Congress which outlines how the future of geoscience would look like. There is a concept of the fourth dimension which I would like to bring in now. And I'm, I'm told that only at two or three research labs, we have this high end uh, dating equipments or instruments. Now, from a fundamental point of view, while we have already covered the obvious geological potential areas, to look at the natural resources, it is extremely important to draw parallel with other countries or the best studied metallogeny or geological settings, be it Australia, be it South Africa, be it Canada or even USA. Now what happens to draw parallel, we have to undertake deep seismic or for that matter, any deeply establishing component of geophysics. It cannot be only one technique. So GSI, I'm aware of it, has already initiated 
a very flagship initiative and i am also aware that ngri also is attached to it and geoscience australia is involved in it are running transects across the aravallis across the chitradurga cyst belt from west to east from dharwar kraton to the kadappa and then across the singum seer zone having the eastern transect the intent is to understand the metallogeny of these transects and look for any deep and concealed mineral deposits because if i if you all agree with me from an economy point of view india is importing about 80 to 82% of crude oil requirement for the country similarly there are many more minerals we are import dependent so while ongc oil india and oil and gas sector in support or with the support of other research institutes are pursuing serious exploration campaigns not only in the mainland or the peninsular india but also off the coast of india in different territories different geological settings so the geosciences frontier is actually getting deeper and deeper in a similar manner we must understand that we need to discover more gold more copper more lead more zinc for consumption of this country while we talk about the bulk minerals and then the deep seated concealed minerals somewhere we have actually lagged and i don't hesitate to say this on the aspect of critical and re minerals irel is doing a good job in terms of harnessing the potential of the beach sand deposits along with amd and gsi and amd are picking up some select deposits where there is likelihood of re deposits occurrences of re's but that is not sufficient this is where again the covid 19 reference i will bring in during this covid 19 uh, pandemic in gsi we had 100 young geologists struck in the gsi ti training institute as part of their annual training program so these future geologists we engage them to scan the entire country to scan all the geological reports available with gsi and created a docket of information which is primarily a concise specific deterministic locations to look for re's and critical and strategic minerals and i'm told by virtue of my interaction with dr sinha amd has also mapped several areas in the country not only for radioactive minerals but also for those lithium for those critical minerals such as lithium cobalt vanadium nickel and the series goes on i'll take a step back while we are looking at it as geologists we should not just stop at discovering them we must on earth enough of them for some process engineer or a metallurgist to look at the downstream part of it because that technology is still elusive to us in this context i had the opportunity of visiting several countries abroad where we have predominant deposition or occurrences of such minerals one of them is the argentina bolivia chile triangle where we have huge salars and using solution mining we are getting the brine out of the surface from subsurface evaporation happens and then we are extracting lithium salt and in addition to that we are also extracting potash from a indian economic perspective while this critical minerals are essential to reduce our import substitution we must acknowledge the fact that all our mineral resources which is used for fertilizer is imported 
there is a huge import bill which is actually draining our exchequer so there is a concerted effort now to explore the possibility of looking for more rock phosphates more potass more bedded salt and we have plenty of them so this is some area where i am sure the future of geoscience applications would actually come into play the world has gone ahead on the concept of solution mining the world has gone ahead on the concept of unearthing more phosphatic phosphatic deposits and it's not that we don't have it we have it probably a lack of focus or a i'll not say lack of focus or kind of in initiating a priority attention to it while we are talking about all this there is another third dimension of geoscience application which is also happening elsewhere in the world and we must practice it and that has got serious applications with respect to coal let's go back coal remains the primary energy requirement for the country and with 82% requirement of oil and gas being made through import we have two interventions to make one create subsurface strategic storages for both crude oil and natural gas i had the opportunity to see creation of these infrastructures elsewhere in the globe and i had the i had the opportunity of getting associated in such infrastructure creation in india now the phase 1 storage program which is called strategic petroleum reserves program has already been commissioned in india and the phase 2 storage program is on the anvil and these storages are primarily in huge rock caverns this is an area which is actually evolving these area these huge caverns are actually multiple times than the tunnels that we built for our powerhouses or our hrt and trts or our railway tunnels and the geological understanding of the location and building these facilities which are 30 meter height 22 meter wide and 1 kilometer long with the process part of it keeping the crude oil within the subsurface located caverns are very very important and such capacity building in addition to other areas has actually taught me that how an integrated approach is essential for the subject of geoscience one more thing which geoscientists we all learn and we must practice is the ability or an opportunity to predict and then having implemented create a enough avenue for back analysis the back analysis is actually a kind of validation now when i reiterate reiterate back analysis it is not to find fault it is to understand has there been any change in my prediction and if so is it for good or it was for bad and if it, if it is for bad could we contain the impact so the concept of back analysis and risk register and risk mapping is all the domain of geoscientists and i would call upon all the geoscientists who are practicing geoscience today in 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 whatever forum they are doing it must develop the concept and as professional societies or the senior leadership of geoscience we must encourage it because when i draw parallel to oil and gas sector on this particular domain i see a beautiful story ongc over a period of time must have drilled enough number of wells and at that point of time in late 80s late 90s early 2000 those exploratory wells or the geophysical data that has been gathered might not have yielded any result 
but is it enough we leave it at leave them as an unutilized data or we should improve upon our data analysis process to revisit them and reintegrate them as part of something called data mining so to me the future of geoscience is actually data mining now data mining which has to be maintained at a single platform unfortunately we do not have it now dgh has done a fantastic job in creating something called a national data repository but that is pertaining to oil and gas data only in a similar effort in gsi we have just started an initiative called national geo data repository ngdr where we expect and it will be mandated rather to upload all the exploration data in whatsoever format it may be it could be urban geophysics it could be subsea geophysics it it could be subsea coring and all the exploration activity which is going on in mainland india will be uploaded there that will actually give us ample opportunity for us to pursue research and assimilate the data and create models to replicate anywhere and draw parallel with any other part of the globe in a similar manner another beautiful derivative of this data which is being successfully done in oil and gas sector is creating auctionable blocks to bring in investment in terms of exploration if we struck hydrocarbon it is actually a double whammy but the intent is to bring in exploration fund in a similar manner you all must be knowing during the path breaking reforms which has taken place in the recent months in the mines and mineral sector and i feel privileged to be part of it uh, as part of the formulation process is it has actually created an enabler to bring in investment and bring in partners or stakeholders who would actually invest in exploration and expedite it and there was a, often there is a question that is there enough for coexistence to me having been the cmd of mecl and dggsi i understand that the country is so huge the untapped potential needs to be revisited again and again so these kind of approaches are actually essential for the geoscientific fraternity to practice and i would suggest that we must as the senior leadership allow our youngsters to be resilient enough because i use the term resilient in the sense that if we don't discover in one go it is not necessary that we will discover in the second attempt it may not be necessary that we discover in the third attempt but the fourth attempt which will turn out to be a discovery would actually give the value in multiple terms so the all the exploration investment and i would reiterate this term not exploration expenses but exploration investment as part of the return now while we talk about all this in terms of resources let's look at the hazards the natural hazards in recent times the entire uttarakhand is actually <clears throat> getting destroyed by virtue of repeat of flash floods and the memories are actually very recent and very scary memories and with the advent of social media we now come to know the first hand information of earthquakes the first hand information of landslides there are phenomenal amount of work for landslide monitoring and detection is happening in various parts of the country in various research organizations it is time to collaborate otherwise these landslides or these earthquakes would happen we cannot stop it but can we evolve a mechanism to predict now the prediction has to be correct in the sense that 
we evacuate people as far as the atmospheric science is concerned we all agree that by virtue of good amount of research by imd for the cyclone monitoring part which is also a geo scientific approach we have been quite successful to predict the track of the cyclone and evacuate people to reduce our casualty can we do it or can we do something like this for the natural hazards that is happening i still remember the massive tsunami that occurred to the eastern part of the country and after that there are several integrated coastal zone mapping projects were launched and i'm aware that phenomenal phenomenal amount of work is being carried out in <clears throat> chennai under niot and nio is also involved there now how soon we can bring it into application while on the same subject of tsunami we are also looking at oceans as part of our economic system and we have several such discoveries lying within the ocean bed or rather sea bed and i'm aware of the fact that the activities by ngri going on for nuts gas hydrates along with ongc and oil india i'm aware of the fact that we have got polymetallic manganese nodules in the sea bed probably those are those future resources if not today maybe tomorrow we need to harness coming back to the coal concept now while oil is still being imported with so much of coal around we need to enhance the usage of coal but under the ambit of clean coal technology while we say clean coal technology as geologists we must understand that clean coal technology is actually not just any process dimension it is actually application of geosciences to reduce the emission of carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide to the environment so the concept of carbon capture underground or in the subsurface aquifers is a domain of geosciences in a similar manner we must look at storage of natural gas in the same format because that is also another area where we see value addition from a geoscientist now coming back again to the coal i would draw attention because we have plenty of them we have coal in the entire gondwana basin of the country unfortunately we don't have coal as good as we have it in australia or in indonesia the ash content is 35% less or more in that range now the option is can we harness those coals in situ through something called underground coal gasification system now if we can adopt underground coal gasification system we can get the synthetic gas which will actually replace the natural gas for the purpose of creating the petrochemical derivatives which has got its use in a similar manner can we use our geoscientific knowledge for anything that is related for the purpose of human mankind in fact while we talk about this natural resources one thing which our colleagues in ngri and cgwb and nrsa is doing they got a fantastic aquifer mapping of the country because ground water is something which bothers each one of us and on the surface water front there is serious geomorphological modeling which is necessary to not only contain our rivers but also create because i would reiterate on this create a kind of a supply chain imperative in terms of the rivers used being used as conduits of our economic development as inland waterway development now what happens as part of this inland waterway development we bring in the concept of sub aqueous dredging and this is where also we as geologist as an engineering application we find use
while we do all these varieties of applications, I would actually go back to the concept of data mining. Because what happens, we must capture these data. And in recent times, we are aware of the usage of data that is being used in our daily life to map not only what we wear, but also what we eat. And I need not elaborate that particular application of digital marketing. Similarly, the digital intervention, not only in oil and gas exploration, which is already in place, we must look at digital intervention in the mineral and mining system. And as geologist, I see enough of opportunity there. Unfortunately, we are yet to create a digital core library for ourselves. Efforts are on, and I'm aware that an automated digital core scanning machine has been procured in MECL in this regard. And GSI is in the process of setting up national data uh, core libraries. Now there it has got two uses. One, you capture the data in a digital medium for the concessionaire to take charge of its auction process. But to me, it is the economic part. The fundamental part is we create a database of mineral assemblages with respect to the host rock. And such mineral assemblages with respect to the host rock would actually be captured over a period of time across the country, across the formations, and across the minerals. And can we, can we use those data for drawing parallels and deciphering something which is otherwise not visible? In all these dimensions of geoscience, before I conclude, I would actually lay emphasis on training. Training is something which we must. I'm aware that all the organizations are doing imparting training to their officers. It's very well structured uh, in ONGC, Oil India, in Coal India. It's very well structured. It is very well structured in AMD. It is very well structured in uh, GSI. It is very well structured in MECL. But I, to me, it is not sufficient. We have several other stakeholders in this game of geoscience for us. We have the Directorate of Mines and Geology Geologists. We have several private sector companies who require this trained manpower to add value to their operations. I'm aware that GSI TIE is conducting training programs, but instead of that, we could have a delta effort, which we call Kaizen effort rather, that the professional societies, which AEZ is doing, and I'm so glad, the professional societies have actually initiated online training. And I'm also aware that several leadership, leadership geo practitioners, I need not name them, but they have now started these training programs in a very structured manner. And these training programs today are not only happening in the country, but it is happening because of the online medium. It is happening across the globe. So primarily, these professional societies have become brand ambassador of the country or of the subject. And in that respect, I find the current generation of geoscientists are very, very fortunate, are very, very privileged, and they must avail this opportunity to make themselves, themselves enable. And here, in addition to resilience, resilience, I would bring in a term called to remain relevant. I would urge upon all the geoscientists to remain relevant in whatever they are doing through these training programs through these mid-carrier options, through these mid-carrier interventions, and to sharpening their skills. It has got two purposes. One, 
they would actually empower themselves by virtue of awareness and information so that their career progression is protected to it would actually meet the basic tenet of our indian economy which i would call and i like so much the current coinage of term atmanirbhar bharat in whatsoever means that we do we are actually contributing to the indian economy so to me it is not less than 2% to the gdp in mines and mineral sector but the impact of geosciences in the indian economy is actually on a multiplier mode so i would i would strongly recommend to all the youngsters to continue their learning skills to remain relevant not only to the subject but also to the profession that they are practicing lastly before i conclude we must pay reverence to all those great geo scientists who have toiled hard to bring the platform to this level and you all would understand that the science that deals with geology or earth sciences is very very difficult and field based we got to travel or traverse across mountainous regions across leech infested dense forest across the north eastern arakan belt across the himalayan terrain across the eastern ghats across the hugely dense domest uh, apna the deccan traps and then the western ghats because i started my career on the intertidal platform of the gulf of cambay where we would get into the sea or the small boat with a tidal value of about 10 meters and a current gushing at a, at a, at a speed of 6 to 8 knots so these kind of field experiences actually makes us i'll not say hardened but actually makes us empathetic persons who would understand the usage or the individual domain expertise so with that the third term that i would bring in in addition to resilience and remaining re relevant is respect as individuals we give respect to others but as individuals i would urge upon to the younger geo scientist to continue to res give respect to the thought process of the other geo scientist because in geology or in geo science disagreement is something which is very very healthy and such disagreements actually results into path breaking or cutting edge research results so with all these thought process of minds i strongly believe that we are on a pedestal today and we have tremendous amount of opportunity beckoning us to take this country into a different league in the next decade and on the fundamental geoscience part the research must continue to bring in more application oriented uh, interventions so once again i would pay i mean i would pay my obeisances to all the great geologists who has been our teachers our immediate bosses our immediate leaders or even we have so many geologists whom we have followed as ecolabia and you all agree with me that there are some geologists who have never taught us but as ecolabia we have emulated him or his or her papers or findings his lectures so there is no stoppage in learning so with this few thoughts of mine i would actually conclude my talk today and again give huge applaud to the organizers of aeg who have done yeoman service to the fraternity of geoscientific community of this country thank you very much thank you dr thank you. rath it was wonderful talk thought provoking and i think uh, for the youngsters it should be mind blowing 
and uh, Tiwari ji wanted to say something. Please go ahead. Right. No, thank you. Uh, I think if there are any other questions, we can entertain that. Yes. Those those who are on MS Teams, they can raise their hand um, and uh, ask questions. And those who are joining through uh, the streaming, they can uh, type over their messages and we can take them up and uh, put before the uh, today's uh, speaker. I think uh, we have a very senior uh, uh, professors like Professor Tendon and uh, uh, our uh, directors from uh, India, like Professor Dimji. Uh, so, do you have, sir, any comments? Uh, Uh, yes, Ash. Yeah, I have a uh, I have a question. You you talked a little bit about the opening up of uh, areas for exploration for collaboration with private entities uh, and international companies, presumably. Um, and we've seen the success of mineral exploration in Australia and Canada, really driven by the junior ex exploration market. These are small companies raise their money on the stock exchanges, um, make those discoveries, pass them on to the mining companies that then uh, do, do the uh, advanced exploration and exploitation there. Do you see a similar role for those smaller companies within in the Indian context, particularly with respect to the stock exchanges and raising raising funds? Well, ask very, very pertinent question. And uh, I think uh, having been involved in the uh, mineral sector for quite a time now and uh, being part of the reforms, I would like to answer this question in a very different manner. Uh, the Indian economy, uh, the specifically the mineral and mining sector per se, is not uh, in, a, in a kind of a similar format that is in existence with Australia, or in South Africa or in Canada. Uh, because I have mapped the Australian economy in terms of mining and mineral sector, the Canada also. There the baseline data is created and then the junior exploration companies, they come in, they invest in the exploration and then they sell that exploration or they would actually, uh, the major mining companies invest or take that exploration data with a premium. That is not the construct in India so far. In India, the exploration work is actually being done by the government setup. So the current reforms, which has actually opened up the thought processes, we would have opportunities for international players to come on board even at the G4 level of exploration. So the state governments are actually going to bring out mineral acreages at the G4 level and the exploration agencies could or the mining companies, why exploration agencies? The mining companies could come and submit their bids for composite license. That means they would first invest in exploration if they are successful they would get seamlessly the mining lease. If they are not successful, there is no harm. The data is generated. So earlier, this particular construct was not there. Only during this two, three months, lot of modifications or amendments have happened, which are going to enable this. And you are right. The country should have enough of baseline data generation. So as Geological Survey of India, uh, I was, as DG, we have conceived about a couple of initiatives in formulating the baseline geoscience data. 
and uh, our colleague, uh, other research organization like NGRI is also coming on board, I'm aware. So these geoscience data will be hosted in National Geo Geological Data Repository. And as international exploration companies or junior mining, junior exploration companies can come and invest. Now, I will answer the other part of your question about the stock exchange. For stock exchange investment, we need a kind of a construct where the mining and mineral sector should be recognized as an industry. Then only you get, you can pick up funds from the market. So I think over a period of time that's going to happen, but I'm aware of the fact that the mining companies, the big ones would like to look at India for the precious metals or the deep and concealed metals. And for them, exploration investment will not be a matter of concern. So yes, India is open to all such concessionary propositions. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And I think that the, uh, the turning that back around to the next generation of geoscientists, it's again another opportunity there. It's another reason why we need to train the next generation, because any company coming in will want that local knowledge. Yes, they'll bring in they'll bring in the knowledge of similar geological domains from elsewhere in the world, but that local knowledge, that local skill set, is going to be really important. So I wholeheartedly endorse your um, your treatise there about needing to really invest uh, in in the local uh, geoscience community and, and and really develop that training. So thank you very much for your presentation. True. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dinesh Gupta, uh, good afternoon to all. It's nice to see all of you after uh, nearly two and a half year. And I compliment uh, my friend uh, Dr. Rath for a nice and elaborate presentation. I've got two more points to make here. One regarding uh, I think Tiwari is, al Tiwari is also aware, Chaturvedi Sahib is also aware, Dr. Rath must be aware when he was having charge of DGGSI. The tender process, uh, which takes a lot of time and ultimately we fail. As you are aware, Airborne Geophysics, we, what we started, we could do only those blocks. But after that, tender processing is not getting success. It is due to red tapism or due to legal practice and all that it is happening. So can at political level or um, at the higher level, this can be overcome <coughs> by some mechanism. So things are simplified. And in due course of time, indigenous capacity building should be there. And uh, I think indigenous comp Indian companies should be encouraged to form a um, come that uh, group and uh, join that, number one. Next, second thing, uh, I think when we started Airborne Geophysics, data airborne data to be supplied to freely to all stakeholders, preliminary data, on which the investment or junior miners or stakeholders comes and take that data. That should be freely available as the practice in Canada and other countries. I've seen that. And, um, but uh, unfortunately, that is not happening. The data is not freely available to all stakeholders. So preliminary data, then based on that, somebody is serious, wants to work further, he can uh, per, go go and detail and uh, purchase detailed data. So that these two points I want to make. And then third, that uh, integration need to be done at the grassroots level. Uh, you are aware that uh, I was in quite senior position and I, I, I tried my best and to some extent it initiated, it started also. But unfortunately, grassroots level, let it be GSI or MECL or many organizations, the compartmental compartmentalization of geology, geophysics, it is still exists. So I feel younger generations need to drive some mechanism. And thank you, uh, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. I will quickly add. Uh, I'll quickly add uh, two takeaways of this because I'm aware um, Dr. Dinesh Gupta had a very illustrious career in uh, GSI. He was the DG GSI also. Now. Uh, one thing which I had left, and I was actually hoping this observation, and it was a deliberate left. As geoscientists, uh, I would also request that it is incumbent upon us to have 
a fair amount of idea about the commercials and about the financials. He rightly said that often the tender conditions fail. But I would say that, that it, yes, we agree that it fails. But as geoscientists who are actually executing such projects, exposure to the commercial conditions, exposure to the project execution philosophy, and exposure to the financial part of it is so, so crucial that we cannot take the shelter of just being a technocrat. We have to be a technocrat, not a, a technologist. There is a huge difference between the two. And I, I, am, I am actually immensely benefited because of this approach. So what Dr. Dinesh Gupta has rightly pointed out that this is something which we must do. So probably in, I remember in GSITI, there is, there is a course or some training program. Otherwise, uh, maybe our professional societies can also start preparing two or three training modules on project execution, on the commercial aspects of the various tender conditions and the financials. As of the data sharing philosophy, recently government of India has brought out a data sharing philosophy and I think that's fairly open. And that has been promulgated uh, by Niti Ayog. So what Dr. Dinesh Gupta has uh, observed is a very pertinent point. And uh, yes, the third one is very, very crucial. We must break these barriers of geophysics, geochemistry, and geology. Because unless the geologist understands the geophysical data processing, they cannot interpret it. And uh, I'm so pleased to see Dr. Rama Rao in the photograph who has been a pioneer geophysicist. And I had the pleasure of attending an AEG conference in Silong along with him. So these barriers are to be broken. Then only we will see the flourishing of science. Uh, Dr. Ramara, uh, do you have some points to make? Ramara, Garu, please unmute your mic. You need to unmute. You have to unmute, unmute, unmute. To go uh, top right and see the mic, click on that and it will be unmuted. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, hearty congratulations to Dr. Ratz. Um, it's so good to hear you and uh, I'm really, it's an inspiring talk, sir. Um, I would like you to reflect on uh, greenfield exploration. This is something uh, uh, that's really the still a gray area in my opinion. All the organizations talk about uh, bringing new areas into exploration. And uh, uh, in your opinion, sir, what extent uh, we have really succeeded in uh, bringing uh, new areas into exploration? And if there is anything we can still do further to improve that, because unless you bring in the 40 percent of uh, Indian area, which is not a textbook, I don't think uh, we can ever uh, claim to be a, an advanced country as far as exploration is concerned. And I once again uh, congratulate you. Thank you. OK, on greenfield exploration, two things that comes to my mind. If you look at the oil and gas sector, we have about 26 sedimentary basins, which is categorized under five categories. The category one is actually the Cambe Basin and the Assam Arakan, which is the prolific ones. And uh, my colleagues in uh, G uh, ONGC and Oil India and the exploration wing of other oil and gas sector and the private sector per se in the oil and gas spectrum are actually converting these category two basins into category one, category three basins into category two. So that is continuously going on in a very structured manner in oil and gas sector. As far as mineral sector is concerned, it is primarily driven by Geological Survey of India. So the initial thought process was, let us map the country. 
Having done that, we have already covered the whole country, uh, which is about 32 square kilometer, 32 lakh square kilometer. And initial, the obvious geological potential area, OGP area, was initially mapped about five and a half lakh square kilometer. Today, we have enhanced that five and a half, half lakh to seven and a half lakh square kilometer. Besides that, as Dr. Dinesh Gupta, he was pioneering that activity actually in GSI, the Airborne Geophysics Campaign. And I'm aware that NGRI is also involved in that. The Airborne Geophysics Campaign was initially done for four blocks each for 12. Another 10 is already in the pipeline. So these national programs are being rolled out in a staggered manner. And uh, I am also, I would be very happy to share that GSI is, has already rolled out the National Geochemical Mapping Program, the National Geophysical Mapping Program. Now, having done the NGCM part, now the thought process is to enhance its utility. So during the last one year of COVID period, what we did, we converted those data that were captured into chemical atlases. Our Western region has brought out two beautiful atlases. So is the central region. So these atlases of chemical enrichment would actually benefit for greenfield exploration. Then extracts of the urban geophysics, we are now looking at heliborn geophysics in areas of Sosar and Sakoli series, in the border of uh, Chhattisgarh and Orissa for so many kimberlite pipes, and in the Kadapa Basin, where the Dharwar, Kraton, and Kadapa Basin, they juxtapose. So having said so, GSI is also now undertaking something called a Deep Seismic Reflection Survey, DSRS, which is primarily done to establish the metallogeny part of the major economic mineral potential areas. And this besides, several other research organizations are doing their independent research pertaining to very, very specific areas, be it the central India or the Nephilim Senate complexes in the country or the alkaline rock masses in the country. So a lot of activity is actually going on. In fact, to be very honest, this requires a kind of a consolidation of activity, which is missing. Thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, I think we are uh, uh, going out of our uh, time plan, uh, but uh, still we can take uh, one or two questions uh, or uh, any comment. Is uh, to come to our, uh, is there? Is there? Uh, we may comment on the, uh, the particularly on the digital data logger, and they have also, I think, initiated uh, for the core logging facility in Ministry of Earth Sciences. So, so can, would you like to make comment on it? Please unmute uh, your mic. Yeah, now now it's okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tiwari, and uh, thank you, Dr. Rath, for a very illuminating talk. Uh, in fact, uh, about a month ago, Dr. Rath and I had uh, a very long discussion, and one of the things that uh, was discussed was the score repository. So the Borehole Geophysics Research Laboratory uh, from the Ministry of Earth Sciences. Earth Sciences has set up a core repository in Karad, and we do ha we have scanned all the cores from the Koena region from um, I think close to ten boreholes. We have scanned all the cores and made a digital library of the cores, and uh, so that's that's one thing. Yeah, and that's very useful because uh, you uh, many times the exploration companies cannot store all the core that they drill. It is physically impossible to store them. So if you can convert um, all of it into a digital form, you cannot do everything with the digital form. 
digital images but you can do a lot you can do still you can still do a lot um, uh, i'm i'm happy that dr dk sinha is here also and i would like to touch upon one important uh, uh, aspect which uh, i would uh, is which, which will basically add to what dr rath said about the priorities in the country and i think he has uh, pointed out very important uh, uh, priorities the three r's uh, resilience uh, uh, relevance and uh, respect but i would i would i would like to say that uh, collaboration is a very important uh, uh, collaboration has a very important role here and uh, we have uh, many of us have derived immense benefits from collaborating between institutions for example uh, i i come from ngri originally um, i have spent uh, more than 20 years in at ngri and while i was there i was in the geothermal studies program and uh, we had a very good collaboration with the atomic minerals directorate and dr sina and the previous directors of amd have been extremely co uh, cooperative so we had a we had a nice uh, tie up in the sense that whenever the boreholes uh, were drilled by the atomic minerals directorate and if some of the boreholes were suitable for making temperature measurements we used to use them for that and we 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 have that has led to a good heat flow database for many country many areas in the country where we ourselves could not drill so i think this kind of a mutual uh, give and take is 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 extremely is extremely relevant today for example we have the core scanner operating and dr rath spoke to me about this while it will be great that uh, dr rath you can uh, you you get your facility started at mecl but you are most welcome to use our facility uh, for uh, for for doing these studies until your facility becomes operational so i think uh, uh these are these are some of the comments which i like to add thank you no i'm so glad uh, yes i recall having spoken with you and uh, uh, i'm also aware that the extension of ngri uh, really looking at the deccan basalt which is still remaining as an enigma and not yet explored so i'm so glad and uh, in between in fact because of covid we could not travel but i am actually looking forward to uh, visit your uh, institute in karad and uh, taking the dialogue further for collaboration thank you thank you it has been very informative uh, talk followed by uh, extensive discussions and uh, comments from the uh, several of the senior colleagues and uh, we we had been immensely benefited at the time when uh, the country is having a uh, one of the biggest challenge of meeting the expectation of the policy maker atmanivar bharat and uh, in in that perspective if we see the talks of today what uh, dr ranjit rat has uh, delivered has been very beneficial and i'm sure uh, there are several uh, take home messages from his talk and uh, we will formally thank him uh, inviting our uh, uh, office bearer uh, dr vijay singh to propose uh, uh, there are some questions in uh, oh. open so, so could you could you just uh, um, speak to them Uh, yes sir mm -hmm. uh, one question is what are the priority areas of focus on integrated approaches in indian context and what are the future prospects for angstas the future can i answer this uh, yes sir okay the please tell the future prospect of the younger geoscientists is immense provided they take the plunge provided they push the envelope provided the question their seniors earlier in management jargon we used to not ask our seniors or challenge our seniors 
i would actually urge upon and request the senior leadership through this mechanism that let us encourage questioning by the youngsters to us or to challenge our thoughts and that will actually enable them to look at out of box propositions and they are in a very good space right now things are happening and things are happening for good things are happening for a change and these changes are immense and they are actually adding value to the society the moment we start believing that every action of ours or every thought of ours or every little effort of ours is adding to the economy then we become more charged so let's not lose heart there is plenty of things around there in fact earlier it used to be only the government sector or the public sector per se with the recent uh, opening of opportunities the private sector is already there and i see more international companies or private sector collaborations going to happen so opportunities are galore and stay relevant okay. so sir there is one more question how do we bring in academics and industry on a common platform see what happens uh, all the industries or say uh, companies they have various internship programs plus while the students are there uh, i would urge all the academicians who are participating in this conference avail the opportunity of utilizing their connect or contact and write to us we will be more than happy to invite the youngsters not only to our head office or to be part of our own training curriculum but also give them opportunity to be part of the field team which will actually open up and then make them ready or take a informed decision whether post academics they want to pursue this vocation or not because it is very very essential that only a privileged few who pursue their career out of choice so these academicians or the faculties uh, must increase the interaction with the industry and i would also urge upon the industry participant to kind of openly encourage such requests which we are doing and we will continue to do Uh, there is one more question how do we uh, get trained our geo scientist in reputed organ indian organizations like ngri gsi amd or maybe similar question can you please repeat the first word is missed uh, how do we get trained our geo scientist in reputed uh, indian organizations like ngri gsi amder go to the website write letters to the head of the organization that's all the current generation of senior leadership in the country are the best of the lot they are very very open they are very very progressive so you have to actually take charge and knock you are right most of the organizations have their own programs to train the students and give the opportunity to young professionals it is the people to reach to them one more question is can you please brief about beach sands if it is in your area of no problem no problem see the, the issue is beach sand is something called uh, a beach placer deposit uh i would urge upon our youngsters to simply visit irel website indian rare arts limited website that gives a huge amount of information about beach sand deposit now before giving them the link these are actually located in the coast of odisha a bit of tamil nadu and andhra pradesh and kerala we don't have much of beach sand deposit in the deccan province that is the coast of gujarat and maharashtra now these are all mineral enrichment of garnet monazite thoriums sillimanite and very very coarse grained minerals coexisting together and if 
people are interested some specific request we can even request cmd irel to offer a visit to the facility which is in odisha it's actually a world class facility where gravity separation happens to separate out these minerals and the minerals which are radioactive element bearing are actually retained and the others are traded so i would urge all the youngsters to spend some time this is a very interesting dimension where uh, uh, even visit to amd and interaction with dr sinha would also yield value thank you uh, we'll move to the dr bijan singh for formal vote of thanks dr bijan singh over to you unmute yourself dr bijender singh hello ha ah, yes please go ahead yeah bijender singh unmute unmute first yes go ahead uh, thank you dr tiwari uh, for giving me this opportunity to express our Thirty vote of thanks. It gives me immense pleasure and sense of gratitude to express our sincere thanks to our learned audience who is present here in the webinar and making this program a grand success. Nevertheless, our special thanks on behalf of AEG and on my personal behalf, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to. Dr. Rath, for giving this very, very illuminating, thought-provoking, and whatnot. This was really a, a wonderful exposition of entire gamut of exploration geophysics, exploration geoscience, exploration geology, which is involved in the exploration of mineral and other resources of this country. I think what Dr. Rath has brought out. the take away is take risk but risk based on not only simply like like that but based on certain models certain they have to carry out work assuming that there are relevant models available to young geo scientists so that they can take a risk in taking a new projects new areas new challenges this is the uh, take up the time because everybody has to not only involve in working in those areas where which has been already explored but venture into those areas which has not been explored but based on models exploration models geodynamic models geophysical models and also based on various geotectonic models see that is very important now what dr rath has mentioned is very important that the young generations young generations has to take risk not only taking the risk but also they have to learn lot of new techniques and technologies like data mining he has brought out concept of data mining and concept of digital models they have to do lot of modeling activities before they uh, venture into any new activities so these are the very important aspect which the dr dhar has brought out he has also emphasized about the training aspect training aspect not only for the young geo scientists but also even the professionals who are already involved for developing new strategies for exploration only one area which uh, dr rath could not mention about was the exploration of especially the ground water and also about the geothermal energy geothermal energy has also potential in india which i am sure that uh, attention has been paid so with this 
uh, things, we will express our sincere thanks to Dr. Rath for very, very illuminating talk. Very, very new dimension which is added to the exploration geoscience frontiers. We must express our sincere thanks for his uh, accepting our invitation. In spite of his very, very busy schedules, we all know that he is CMD of uh, so many organizations, but he could uh, spare his valuable times and given us a lot of new uh, thought provoking ideas. Not the least, we must express our sincere thanks to Director NGR for giving this, for arranging this lecture, technical support for this webinar. So you must thank all the people involved in arranging these lectures from NGR side. So with these few words, I will thank you all for attending this lecture. Thank you once again. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.